I took my wife out to dinner tonight at Aoli Bodega. This is the second time I've gone there with her. They have excellent food. If you are ever in the Sacramento area, I highly recommend them. No, I'm not getting paid for this. This is just my way of easing you into the crap storm of what we're about to go over. I caught a bit of this video today. I caught it in two parts and it's pretty terrible. I mean, just all things considered, it's pretty terrible. The, uh, the protest at Leon Valley is just, just pathetic. Not that, I mean, they're, they're protesting a trespass violation. I mean, <laughs> like all of a sudden these sovereign citizens are totally not about property rights. Oh my God. <laughs> it's retarded. Anyway, so they're, they're protesting somebody doing something that's clearly illegal and it's not a constitutional violation. I've already gone over in other uh, sections the Texas trespass law where they specifically state that, you know, your First Amendment rights are limited on city property if it's not a traditional public forum. So there's just, I mean, for all you people out there who were still thinking that these guys are fighting for your constitutional rights, trespassing is not a constitutional right. Period. You don't have a right to trespass. So, no, it's not about constitutional rights. So David, dressed with his retard helmet, because, you know, that soft skull thing going on, I guess. goes maybe he just filters himself for his other videos or maybe he senses a meal ticket in the sovereign citizen outlet i'm not entirely sure which actually let me step back before we go into david and his soft skull theory i just want to point out that these in air quotes protesters have been filming now for how many days not to mention the fact that Padilla filmed quite a bit before he was trespassed. And I went over that too. His trespass was completely legit. It was completely legit. He was told to leave. He didn't leave. Boom, trespass. Ah, but the lady told him that it was open to the public. Yeah, and then the chief of police told him it wasn't. Congratulations. It became an official trespass when the chief of police who had apparent authority to tell him to leave, told him to leave. Okay, we've got that out of the way. This is stupidity going on out here. So let's go back to uh, David in his retard helmet. So David has been spinning a yarn about how the police are becoming federalized. And had he constrained himself to the actual facts of it, where the police are becoming militarized and there is at least reasonably speaking an issue with them rolling down the street in MRAP vehicles and wearing military fatigues and acting basically as paramilitary organizations one could one could express a reasonable argument against that if one wasn't acting like a soft head but then, but then our good hero, Mr. Warden, bitter from his recent defeat at Pine Valley, launches into this. Not only just equipment, but you get the U.S. government to back you up. If there's a lawsuit, you get sued because of something you did. The U.S. government's going to provide your attorney. The U.S. government may even indemnify you and prevent prosecution because you're acting on behalf of the U.S. government. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a sniper that killed a, a lady up in um, Oregon, I believe it was. Uh, Ron Harucci, Ron Harucci, worked for the FBI. If I remember the Randy Weaver seizure. Yeah. Seizure. Se seizure? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> seizure. Seizure. Singular. Yeah, um, Ron Harucci murdered Randy Weaver's wife while she stood in a doorway holding a nine-month-old baby. Thank you, Hunter. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, no so the state um, uh, 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 brought charges, and they were going to prosecute him. The United States government, Department of Justice, stepped in and said, we're not going to allow that. We're going to protect him. You cannot prosecute him. That was the end of it. The U.S. government interfering in state business, protecting somebody that broke the law. He murdered a woman standing in the doorway holding a baby. 
and I'll give you all a little other tip of information that probably a lot of you don't know. Lon Harucci was present in Waco as well, and his sniper post where he was stationed, he said he never fired a shot, but there were empty cartridge shells and the same caliber as his rifle located there. Yep. And without getting off too, too far off topic. All right, anyway, I think we got enough. So, I mean, that sounds terrible. This is Lon Harucci. Boy, somebody needs to stop him, right? Now, I could take you to the Wikipedia article, which also exonerates Lon Harucci. But instead of taking you there, I'm going to take you to Idaho v. Harucci. We're going to read this in all of its long-windedness. Yes, it is a long decision. We're going to go over it. So this is the point where you pause the video, you get your cup of coffee, you get your ice-cold beer, whatever you need to do, go potty, because... Uh, because we're going to see, we're going to see the difference between propaganda and a federal court of appeals decision. I have to move my microphone out of my way so I can see the screen. All right, E. The criminal complaint charging Haruchi with the crime of involuntary manslaughter was filed in Idaho State Court. It wasn't for murder, it was for involuntary manslaughter. Strike one for Mr. Warden. Specifically, the complaint alleged that Haruchi did unlawfully but without malice. Kill Vicky Weaver, my dog just sat on me. He's going to act a fool, I guess. Did kill Vicky J. Weaver, a human being, in the operation of a firearm in a reckless, careless, or negligent manner, to wit, discharging the firearm through the front door of the Weaver residence in an attempt to shoot Kevin Harris as he entered the front door from the outside, without first determining whether any person other than his intended target was present on the other side of the door, a violation of IC, which would be the Idaho Code, 18-4006, subsection 2, a felony. So was Vicky J. Weaver standing in the doorway? He discharged the firearm through the front door. Did Lon Haruchi see Vicky Weaver? I am drinking a beer. No, I'm not an alcoholic. Mr. Uh, Common Joe asked me, Oh, you drink two beers? Do you stop at two because you're an alcoholic? Yeah, you moron. Alcoholics stop at two beers. That's how alcoholism works. My God, can you say anything? Can you say anything that has a shred of coherency to it? Ugh. Sorry. All right. So uh, he, according to this, the complaint alleged, this is what the uh, state of Idaho alleged. So this is like worst case scenario. This is, this is what they were hoping to convict Lon Harucci of. They didn't, they didn't want to convict him of murder. They wanted to convict him of involuntary manslaughter, specifically taking a shot at Ken Har Kevin Harris, missing Kevin Harris. The shot went through the front door, not the front doorway, but through the front door of the Weaver residence. Recklessly, carelessly, or negligently killing Vicky J. Weaver. Sounds, this Lon Harucci sounds like a terrible person. I mean, doesn't this sound exactly like what Mr. Warden was saying it was? Harucci removed the prosecution to federal court pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1442 subsection A1. Is that the federal government stepping in? Mr. Warden, or were you lying? Were you uninformed? Were you misinformed? Or were you lying, Mr. Warden? The district court dismissed the charge on the ground. The supremacy clause protected Haruchi from prosecution because the criminal case sought to punish Haruchi for actions taken in pursuit of his duties as a federal law enforcement officer. We affirm, oh, this must be groundbreaking new law. It sounds like the federal government stepped in and supplied Mr. Haruchi with an attorney. Uh, let's see. 
Earl J. Silbert, Adam S. Hoffinger, and Robert A. Salerno, Piper and Marbury, Washington, D.C. Hmm. It sounds like a government agency right there. DLA Piper Global Law Firm. Well, that's funny. I thought the federal government was supplying him with, with attorneys. Oh, that's a terrible web page. It was 18 years ago that this happened, so maybe those lawyers aren't with them anymore. But this doesn't appear to be the federal government. This appears to be a private firm. I'm going to step far out on a limb here and suggest that maybe maybe the defendant, Lon Haruchi, hired his own attorneys. Could be, huh? Could be. It doesn't sound like you're uh, very well informed, Mr. Warden. Factual background on August 21st, 1992, there was an outstanding warrant for Randall Weaver, Vicki Weaver's husband, based on weapons trafficking charges. That was bullcrap, by the way. It was a sawed-off shotgun or something stupid. I don't know why people are getting killed over somebody sawing off a shotgun, but whatever. <clears throat> I'm not a fan. I, I don't understand why a sawed-off shotgun is any more dangerous than a regular shotgun. If you could carry a pistol, why can't you carry a sawed-off shotgun? I'm sorry. I digress. On August 21st, 1992, several federal agents, Haruchi not among them, went to serve the ward on the Weaver Ranch at Caribou Ridge, a.k.a. Ruby Ridge. The agents encountered Randall Weaver, his teenage son Sammy, and friend Kevin Harris on the road leading to the ranch. A gun battle erupted during the encounter. Deputy Marshal Deegan was shot and killed, as was Sammy Weaver. Federal agents did not know Sammy was killed. Randall, Weaver, and Kevin Harris retreated to the ranch with Sammy's body and placed it in the birthing shed, a structure on the Weaver, Weaver property. The same day, the FBI dispatched a response force to the area, including hostage, hostage rescue team, to which Haruchi belonged as a sniper. I'm going to drink another sip of beer. Delicious. Haruchi was a highly trained marksman and qualified to hit a quarter of an inch target at 220 yards. He was also trained to hit a moving target. Upon arrival, Haruchi was briefed. According to Haruchi's trial testimony, the briefings included, among other things, that Deputy U.S. Marshal Diggin had been shot and killed in a firefight near the Weaver residence, that during the firefight, the marshals were pinned by indiscriminate fire, that either Harris, Randall Weaver, or Vicki Weaver was involved. Oh, my dog's going to get right in front of me. Okay. All right. Come on in, buddy. Come on in. All right. He's moving on. All right. There we go. Uh, that either Harris, Randall Weaver, or Vicki Weaver was involved in the shooting of Deputy Deegan, that Randall Weaver had been in the military attached to a special forces unit, that the individuals in the cab cabin had a habit of coming out of the cabin armed, that whenever the dogs barked, Randall Weaver sent out one of the Weaver children to a rock outcropping to look for the source of the disturbance and report back to him, that Randall Weaver may have called in or had assistance from other individuals either living in the area or from outside the area moving into the location that the marshals had been attempting to effect an arrest of randall weaver for a firearms violation that the decision had been made that any team members going up the hill toward the cabin were in danger Finally, Haruchi was briefed on the final rules of engagement that the FBI had developed for the Ruby Ridge crisis. The ordinary rules of engagement provided the F that an FBI agent may use deadly force only in self-defense or with a reason to believe that they are in danger of grievous bodily harm. The FBI modified these rules for the Ruby Ridge crisis. Originally, the team was told to shoot any armed adult if the shot could be taken without risk of harm to a child. Later that day, the rules were modified and restricted to advise that deadly force can be used against any armed adult male if the shot could be taken without a child being injured. The following day, Haruchi, armed with a high-powered 308 caliber rifle with a 10-power telescopic sight, took a position approximately two to 300 yards from the Weaver Ranch. From his position, Haruchi had a direct view of the cabin side. He could also see the front porch and the back deck of the cabin. He could not see the front door when it was closed. If the front door opened, he could see it, but could not see inside the cabin. At Weaver's trial, Haruchi testified at the, 
that at around 5.45 or 5.50 p.m., a young woman came out of the cabin and moved toward the rock outcropping. She remained outside for a few minutes before returning inside. Haruchi did not fire at the young female because she was not armed and he assumed she was a child. Right after the female went back inside the front door, a male exited out the back door of the cabin to the back deck and appeared to be checking some ponchos or blankets before returning inside. Haruchi did not fire at the male because he did not appear to be armed. Haruchi further testified that, a few minutes later, he heard a helicopter crank up on the valley floor, lift off, lift off, and then he saw it disappear behind the trees. Haruchi heard the helicopter flying either behind him or to his le right or left, but he could not see it. The federal agents used helicopters to get an overview of the land. Within 10 seconds after the helicopter lifted off, two males and a young female, later identified as Harris, Randall Weaver, and Weaver's teenage daughter Sarah, exited the cabin and ran toward the rock outcropping. This outcropping had been described to Haruchi during his briefing as a lookout position. The three were dressed similarly in dark clothing. The last out the door, a male had a long gun held in a high port carry, meaning up high near his chest. The three disappeared from Haruchi's view for about three to five seconds. They reappeared again, passed the rock outcropping for another three to five seconds, and then disappeared again. Haruchi told his partner to stay on the front door of the residence while he looked through the trees to see where the three individuals had disappeared. Haruchi thought they were moving to defensive positions located along the rock outcropping. Next, he saw the man carrying the long rifle come around the corner of the birthing shed. The man picked up a stick, prodded at the ground, and looked up in, and looked in the air in the area above and to the right of Haruchi. Haruchi heard a helicopter in the area where the man was looking and thought the man was looking for, at the helicopter. The man moved out of Haruchi's sight for a few more seconds. His partner remained out on the front door. When the man reappeared, he carried the weapon in the high port position and scanned the area above and behind Haruchi's location. Haruchi assumed the man was looking at the helicopter. The man continued to move along the side of the building with a gun and a high port carry like he was getting ready to use it. Haruchi believed the man would t try to take a shot at the individuals in the helicopter, so he fired at the armed man. At the time, Haruchi believed that he had missed, but he had, in fact, lightly wounded the man. The man turned the corner behind the birthing shed. Within 10 to 20 seconds of Haruchi's first shot, the three ran back into the cabin. A man carried the rifle and followed about 10 yards behind the other man and the teenage girl who ran together. Haruchi assumed the man with the rifle was the same man who he believed was attempting to shoot at the helicopter and who he had shot at earlier. In fact, the first man Haruchi shot at was Randall Weaver, and the man now carrying the rifle was Kevin Harris. Haruchi assumed this man was moving back to the house to get in a more protected location and decided to shoot him. He knew that once the man reached the house, the man could shoot at Haruchi, his fellow agents, or the helicopter, but the agents could not shoot back because of the children. Haruchi was attempting to prevent the man from getting back into the house. Haruchi testified that the man that Harris ran or Haruchi testified that Harris ran at a high rate of speed toward the cabin, slowed down, paused, and then continued through the door. Specifically, Haruchi testified that he, Harris, had his weapon in his right hand and he was reaching out with his left hand. It appeared to me that he was trying to hold the door open or moving somebody out of the way, and that's the time I shot. Harris flinched and disappeared in the house. It was approximately, it was approximately 6 p.m. Haruchi had led Harris to account for the distance that Harris would move while the bullet traveled through the intervening 200 yards. Consequently, the crosshairs of the rifle were on the open door a few inches ahead of Harris. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to Haruchi, Vicky Weaver was on the far side of the door holding it open out of Haruchi's view. The bullet hit her, in the head, killing her. It then struck Harris in the shoulder. At the Weaver trial, Haruchi testified that he could not see through the door, did not know if someone was behind the door, had not seen Vicky Weaver, and only intended to hit Harris. He did not consider his shot a shot into the house. The front door to the cabin opens out. The bullet went through the lower right-hand pane of glass on the top half of the cabin's front door. The top half of the door was glass with six divided panes. There were denim curtains that could be pulled over the windows. It is disputed whether it is disputed whether the curtains over the glass portion of the door were open or closed at the time of Haruchi's shot. Sarah Weaver testified at the preliminary hearing that her family never closed the curtains. However, it was determined that Randall we at Randall Weaver's trial that the bullet hole in the curtain lines up with the bullet hole in the glass only if the curtain is pulled across the glass. The witnesses testified differently as to where Vicki Weaver was standing right before and when Haruchi fired the fatal shot. Haruchi says he did not see her. Randall Weaver testified at the preliminary hearing that Vicki Weaver had been standing three to four feet beyond the porch holding the baby just after he was shot at, or just after he was shot at the birthing shed, but he had not seen her until he had been shot. 
However, when questioned regarding Vicki Weaver's location when she was shot, Randa Weaver testified that she came out of the house with the baby. She might have been on the porch. I don't know, to be honest with you. I know she had the baby when she hollered at me and she was holding the baby when we went through the door. Sarah Weaver testified at the preliminary hearing that her mother was holding the door open as Sarah, Randa Weaver, and Harris were running for the door. Direct exam- During direct examination, Sarah testified that after the first shot, her mother stepped out of the door and yelled what happened. Sarah further stated that as she stumbled into the house, her mother was standing right in front of the doorway. However, in cross-examination, she clarified her earlier testimony and stated she does not remember if Vicki Weaver was outside the threshold of the door. Neither Randall nor Sarah Weaver saw the bullet hit Vicki Weaver. After a review of the record, the district court concluded, The record supports Mr. Harucci's subjective belief that the threat to his or others' lives honestly existed, that he intended only to shoot the third individual, Mr. Harris, and that the state has provided no evidence of malice or criminal intent. The record also supports a finding that the means by which Mr. Hershey carried out his duties were objectively reasonable based on the circumstances, and that he did not see Mrs. Weaver behind the door or in the doorway when he fired at Mr. Harris. Based on these conclusions, the district court held that Hershey was entitled to immunity from criminal prosecution under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution of the United States and dismissed the indictment pursuant to Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure 12b1. See Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure 12b1. Discussion and another sip of beer. I don't know about you, but Haruchi sounds like a terrible, terrible individual so far. Because the direct, or I'm sorry, because the district court neither held an evidentiary hearing nor purported to resolve any disputed issues of fact, and the critical issues necessary to resolve the legal issues are not in dispute, our standard of review is de novo. See U.S. v. Head, etc. In the leading case of Cunningham v. Neagle, 135 U.S. 1, 10 Supreme Court, 658, 34 L.E.D. 55, 1890. So this is obviously new and novel law. Also known as Inri Neagle, the Supreme Court considered a petition for writ of habeas corpus filed by Deputy United States Marshal Neagle. Sarah and David Terry had publicly threatened the life of Justice Field, who had presided over a case involving them in his capacity as circuit judge for the Ninth Circuit. Consequently, Neagle had been assigned to protect Justice Field during his travels in California, the Terry's home state. While briefly stopped in Fresno en route from Los Angeles to San Francisco, the Terrys boarded the train carrying Justice Field. David Terry attempted to broke a fight with Justice Field, and when Terry appeared to reach for a knife, Deputy Neagle shot him to death. The state of California brought criminal charges against Neagle. The Supreme Court granted the petition for a writ of habeas corpus. In considering the supremacy of the government of the United States, the court held, if the prisoner is held in state court, to answer for an act which he was authorized to do by the law of the United States, which it was his duty to do as a marshal of the United States, and if, in doing that act, he did no more than what was necessary and proper for him to do, he cannot be guilty of a crime under the law of the United or under the law of the state of California. Subsequent cases have developed this holding into a doctrine of immunity. See a bunch of stuff. To be entitled to immunity under this doctrine, the defendant must show two elements. First, the act must have been within the scope of official authority. Second, the defendant must have honestly and reasonably believed the act to have been necessary and proper under the circumstances. The second element of the test thus has both objective and subjective elements. Immunity is properly decided on a 12B motion. Haruchi brought this motion to dismiss based on the Supremacy Clause immunity under the Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 12b. Sounds like the uh, U.S. Supreme Court was trying to, or I'm sorry, sounds like the U.S. government was trying to give him immunity, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like he's taking advantage of the laws as written. It sounds like he's trying, or the government's trying to protect him. Oh, Mr. Warden, you have let your hatred of cops cloud your judgment, sir. 
We must first decide if immunity is properly decided on such a motion. Rule 12b provides for pretrial motions to dismiss raising defenses and objections based on defects in the indictment or information. The advisory committee notes to this provision adopted in 1944 state that such objections and defenses include all defenses and objections which are capable of determination without a trial of the general issue, including former jeopardy, former conviction, former acquittal, statute of limitations, immunity, lack of jurisdiction, failure of indictment, or information to state on an offense, etc. When possible, supremacy clause immunity is an issue that should be determined before the trial in order to avoid making the federal officer go through an entire, entire state criminal procedure if he's immune. We thus agree with the Sixth Circuit's holding in Long that as a general proposition, a Rule 12b motion is a proper vehicle by which to assert the defense of immunity under the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution. Scope of authority. We therefore turn to the question of whether Haruchi's actions were necessary and proper under the circumstances. This determination requires an inquiry into whether Haruchi honestly, subjective standard, and reasonably, objective standard, believed his actions to be necessary and proper. Haruchi does not have to show that his action was in fact necessary or in retrospect justifiable, only that he reasonably thought it to be. And now is a good time for another sip of beer. And my dog farted conveniently right then, so that sip of beer tasted like a dog fart. Delicious. The district court found that Haruchi honestly and reasonably believed that the intentional shooting of Mr. Harris was necessary and proper based on existing circumstances at Ruby Ridge on August 22, 1992. The record supports this finding. First, there is nothing in the record to dispute the district court's finding that Haruchi's subjective belief that his actions were necessary and proper was honestly held. The state has presented no evidence of evil or malicious intent, nor has the state shown any facts to dispute Haruchi's state of mind. In fact, the state only charged Haruchi with manslaughter, a crime that is specifically charged as being without malice. Every time I go over this, that the elements are necessary, this is why. This is what lawyers get paid to do. It's the elements. It's all about the elements. I am the airbender. It's about the elements. Second, the record supports the district court's finding that Haruchi's belief was objectively reasonable. The entire period of time between when Haruchi took his first shot at Randall Weaver and the second shot at Harris lasted only a few seconds. During these few seconds, he saw two men come out of the cabin who he assumed correctly were Randall Weaver and Kevin Harris. Haruchi had been briefed that either Harris or Weaver had killed a federal agent the day before. He knew at least one of them was armed as he saw one carrying a rifle. He had been briefed that the residents of the cabin were always armed. While carrying the rifle in a high port position like he was getting ready to use it, the armed man scanned the sky looking toward the area where the helicopter filled with federal agents hovered. Haruchi took his first shot at the armed man, so the men were aware that he was nearby. All three disappeared from view for a few seconds, and then Haruchi saw all three individuals running back toward to the cabin. One of the men, Harris, hung, hung back slightly from the other two carrying a rifle. Haruchi fired his second shot. We have previously addressed the question of when a law enforcement officer may use deadly force against an escaping felon. In Fort v. Richardson, we interpreted the Supreme Court's holding in Tennessee v. Gardner regarding the constitutional use of deadly, deadly force. Gardner held, where the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a threat of serious physical harm either to the officer or to others, it is not constitutionally unreasonable to prevent escape by using deadly force. Thus, if the suspect threatens the officer with a weapon or there is probable cause to believe that he has committed a crime involving physical harm, deadly force may be used if necessary to prevent escape and if, where feasible, some warning has been given. In for it, we held that under Garner, it was reasonable for officers to shoot for it, a suspect in a vicious assault during a home invasion robbery to prevent his escape. Ford had eluded officers for over an hour, vaulting fences and removing clothing. He was fleeing into a residential area where he could easily have taken hostages. We held that even if his capture were inevitable, deadly force was still reasonable because there was a substantial risk that Ford would cause death or serious bodily injury if his, apprehensions wa if his apprehension were delayed. Wouldn't that be was delayed? Hmm. 
Like for it, Harris presented a greater danger to the officers and to others if he got back inside the cabin, in part because the cabin provided cover from the marshals. Once outside, Harris could take up a defensive position where he could shoot out. I'm sorry, once inside, Harris could take up a position where he could shoot out. But the officers could not shoot him without danger of harming a child. Further, Harris could rearm himself and regroup with the others in the cabin. Haruchi had been briefed that Randall Weaver may have been called, had, may have called on, or had assistance from other individuals in the area. He knew that all of the Weavers were armed. In fact, the initial gun battle where Marshal Deegan had been killed occurred because the marshals were trying to arrest Randall Weaver for a firearms violation. Finally, Haruchi knew that either Randall Weaver or Harris had shot and killed a marshal and that the armed man had just threatened a helicopter filled with federal agents. Clearly, the armed man was dangerous. And I just had a dog fart free sip of, sip of beer. Mm-mm-mm. Haruchi knew that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to apprehend the man once he had re-entered the cabin due to the presence of the Weaver children. Had he hesitated even for a few seconds or called out a warning, even assuming Harris could have heard him from 200 to 300 yards away, Harris could have fled into the cabin, taking up a defensive armed position. Courts must avoid the temptation to dissect the events which flash before a police officer in a matter, matter sec in a matter of seconds and to over scrutinize the officer's response to those events. It is all too easy for judges pondering a cold record in the sanctity of their chambers to second guess the split second decision of the split second decisions of the officer on the scene. As judge Trott recently observed in cold print, the events appear one way, but as they were unfolding, they surely had a different cast and immediacy. Faced with a dangerous armed man who was running to an area where he could present a greater danger, Haruchi had less than a few seconds to make a decision. In the words of Justice Holmes, detached reflection cannot be demanded in the presence of an uplifted knife. Harris was a suspect in the shooting of a federal marshal. He was threatening a helicopter. He was running to a place where he could rearm, regroup, and take up a defensive position. Haruchi could not see Vicki Weaver standing behind the open door with the curtains closed. He had no reason to believe a woman holding a baby would be standing outside the threshold of the cabin, but hidden by the open door after her husband had been shot by an unknown agent. Haruchi saw no danger to others, and he shot. He intended, or he only intended to hit Harris. The district court's finding that Haruchi reasonably believed that shooting Harris was necessary and proper under the circumstances is supported by the evidence. Today, all must regret the tragic result. However, given the circumstances at the time, Haruchi made an objectively reasonable decision. The facts in Clifton v. Cox are closely analogous to the present situation. In Clifton, we considered murder charges brought by the state of California against Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs agent Lloyd Clifton. Clifton had been involved in a helicopter raid on the cabin of Dirk Dickinson. Doesn't that sound like the name of a villain in a crime novel? Dirk Dickinson, a suspected manufacturer of drugs. As Clifton exited the helicopter, fellow agent Philbin crumpled to the ground, believing Philbin had been shot Clifton kicked in the door of the cabin and charged at Dickinson. Dickinson fled into the woods. Clifton called to him to halt. Dickinson did not, believing that Dickinson had shot his fellow agents and that Dickinson would pose a greater danger to the other agents if he reached the shadow of the woods. Clifton shot him. Dickinson died. He turned out to be unarmed, and Philbin had simply tripped. Relying on Neagle, we found Clifton to be immune from state court prosecution. Clifton acted within the scope of his authority and his conduct was necessary and proper under the circumstances. In Clifton, we found that the agent's behavior was objectively reasonable. Clifton incorrectly believed that a federal officer had just been shot, that the suspect was armed, and that the suspect, though fleeing, would present a greater danger to the pursuing agents if he reached the safety of the woods. Here, the facts are even more persuasive than in Clifton. Haruchi knew a federal officer had been shot. He knew Harris was armed. He thought Harris had threatened the helicopter, and he thought Harris would present a greater danger to the agents if he reached the safety of the home. 
The state claims that here, unlike in Clifton, the evidence is hotly disputed. And thus, under Morgan v. California, the court should not have granted the motion to dismiss. Morgan is distinguishable. There, we considered whether the circumstances warranted a conclusion that the officers were in fact acting within the scope of their official duties at the time of the state law violations. Several drug enforcement agents had, apparently while drunk, backed their car into the car of a civilian couple. According to the couple, the agents brandished their guns and threatened the couple with arrest. The state of California charged the agents with several misdemeanor violations, including driving under the influence, assault with a deadly weapon, brandishing a firearm, and unlawful use of force. The agents in Morgan petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus, claiming that when the incident occurred, they had been en route to a meeting with an informant. The state, however, contended the agents had merely been on their way to another bar. We reversed as an abuse of the of discretion the district court's granting of the writ on the ground that the disputed issues that that disputed issues of material fact rendered this particular controversy hotly disputed. In reversing the order or I'm sorry, in reversing the order granting the writ of habeas corpus, we held that the grant of the writ was proper only if one Viewing the disputed evidence in the light most favorable to the state, it is clear that Morgan and Swanson were acting within the scope of their federal authority and that their actions were necessary and proper to carry out that authority, or two, it is shown that the state criminal prosecution is intended to frustrate the enforcement of law of federal law. In the present case, unlike Morgan, the evidence is not hotly disputed. The state argues that it is unclear where Vicki Weaver was standing at the time of the fatal shot, and therefore it is disputed whether Haruchi saw her. Haruchi states that he did not see Vicki Weaver. The state has produced no evidence that, it is mater- that is materially inconsistent with Haruchi's testimony. Although the state points to the testimony of both Sarah Weaver and Randall Weaver that each saw Vicki Weaver come outside the house, thus implying that Haruchi should have seen her, Neither one can place her outside the threshold of the door in a location that Haruchi could see at the time the fatal shot was fired. Sarah Weaver testified that as she stumbled into the house, her mother was standing right in front of the doorway. She did not, however, remember if Vicki Weaver was outside the threshold of the door. Although Randall Weaver testified that Vicki Weaver had been standing three or four feet beyond the porch holding the baby just after he was shot at the birthing shed, when questioned regarding Vicki Weaver's location when he was running back toward the house, Randall Weaver did not know where she was standing. She came out of the house with a baby. She, may, she might have been on the porch. I don't know, to be honest with you. I know that she had the baby when she hollered at me, and she was holding the baby when we went through the door. Neither Sarah nor Randall Weaver's testimony is inconsistent with Haruchi's testimony that he did not see Vicki Weaver. Haruchi states that he never saw Vicki Weaver. Once Randall Weaver, Sarah Weaver, and Kevin Harris came outside the cabin, he watched them, often through the narrow scope of his rifle. He told his partner to stay on the front door. Even taking as true Randall Weaver's uncertain testimony that his wife may have been three to four feet off the porch at the time he was shot, this testimony is not inconsistent with Haruchi's testimony that he never saw Vicki Weaver. The state points to Haruchi's own testimony that he saw Harris ran toward toward the house. He, Harris, had his weapon in his right hand and he was reaching out with his left hand. It appeared to me like he was reaching to hold the door open or moving someone out of the way, and that's the time I shot. Although Haruchi's statement is not clear, it does not imply that Vicki Weaver was outside the threshold of the door, that Haruchi saw her, or that he knew she was behind the door. The district court did not, as is argued by the state, improperly decide a disputed issue of fact. Haruchi's testimony that he never saw Vicki Weaver and did not know she was behind the door is not disputed. Finally, the state would have us hold that it was objectively unreasonable for Haruchi to shoot because the rules of engagement were obviously unconstitutional. We need not pass on the constitutionality of the rules of engagement as such. It is Haruchi's conduct, 
not the rules of engagement which must be judged. The state cites extensively to Harris v. Roderick, where Kevin Harris filed a Bivens suit claiming that Harucci used deadly force unconstitutionally. The district court denied Harucci's and the other agents' motion to dismiss on the ground of qualified immunity. On interlocutory appeal, this court upheld the district court's holding. With regard to Harucci's claim for qualified immunity, this court stated, It is extremely doubtful that Harucci will ever be able to establish that he is entitled to qualified immunity for his conduct in shooting Harris. As the record now stands, he cannot do so. Although predicated on the same incident, this court's decision in Harris is not applicable to the case before us now. The court there determined only that Harucci could not establish qualified immunity on a motion to dismiss. Accordingly, all statements made in Harris were based on the untested allegations of Harris's complaint. In determining qualified immunity, the court must take the allegations in the plaintiff's complaint as true. The court did not consider many facts apparent on the record in this case, such as Harucci's belief that the armed man was a threat to the helicopter. In the present case, the court must determine Harucci's claim for supremacy clause immunity based on the evidence as presented here. Oh, it's time for another sip of beer. We're almost through it, boys and girls. And non-binary persons. Or whatever. Moreover, Harris was decided on the issue of qualified immunity, not supremacist clause immunity. The state wrongly attempts to collapse the standards of qualified immunity into the objectively reasonable prong of supremacy clause immunity. The two immunities are not the same, nor do they serve the same purposes. Immunity under the supremacy clause from state criminal prosecution may cover instances in which qualified immunity does not apply. Supremacy clause immunity derives from, the, from a specific provision of the Constitution itself, the purpose of which is to establish that federal law is the supreme law of the land. Accordingly, a federal agent doing his job in a way that is necessary and proper should not be held to answer to a state court criminal charge. In Bivens' claims, on the other hand, qualified immunity protects a federal agent from being sued in a civil case by an individual for violating the person's constitutional rights. Qualified immunity analysis is the same for Bivens' actions against federal officials as it is for claims against state officials under 42 U.S.C. 1983. Thus, the concern addressed by supremacy clause immunity, protecting a federal agent from being held to answer for state laws, is not at issue in qualified immunity. If you don't understand that, it's because the supremacy clause is protecting the federal agent from state laws, Qualified immunity is working on federal laws. The Bivens claim and the 1983 suit, those are federal laws, so the supremacy clause wouldn't apply to federal laws. I hope that makes sense. Supremacy clause immunity needs to be more protective than qualified immunity because it protects federal agents from the severity of being criminally convicted and having to face state criminal sanctions. Qualified immunity simply protects against monetary sanctions in a civil suit. Further, the federal government itself, not just the agent, has a real stake in upholding supremacy clause immunity. In sum, the two immunities are separate, and there are no grounds for collapsing the two. The judgment of the district court dismissing the charge against Haruchi is therefore affirmed. Now, I hope you saw some things in this. I hope you saw the reasoning for immunity, the reasoning behind qualified immunity and the reasoning behind the supremacy clause immunity. I hope you could see that Haruchi was not intending to murder Vicki Weaver. And I hope that you can kind of see where, uh, Mr. Warden, I almost want to apologize about him uh, being a soft head, but God, he looks retarded in that helmet. 
Also, some other fun facts. Uh, he's claiming to be carrying a 44 Magnum. So there was some question going on as to how a convicted felon, a sex offender, would be carrying a firearm under Texas firearm laws. And that he is claiming to carry a 44 Magnum does raise some serious questions on how he's accomplishing that. And to be perfectly frank with you, I don't know. Uh, there was a suggestion that he was carrying a black powder weapon, which would be exempt. Um, I don't believe that 44 Magnums are black powder. I mean, I'm not a complete revolver lover by any stretch of the imagination. I am much more an automatic guy. But, uh, yeah, I've never seen a black powder 44 Magnum. I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I'm just saying I've never seen one. So, yeah. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. The very long reading of Idaho v. Haruchi clearing up uh, Mr. News Now Houston's um, biased and terrible rendition of events. Now, before everybody jumps in and thinks that I'm completely on board with the federal government, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I don't like Ruby Ridge. I don't think it was a good decision on the part of the federal government. I don't like Waco. I also think Waco was a terrible decision on the part of the federal government. I don't think sawed-off shotguns should be illegal any more than non-sawed-off shotguns. I mean, if you want to make a terribly inaccurate shotgun, I think you should have that right. I've seen, I don't know how legal they are to be perfectly honest with you, but I've seen pistols that shoot what, uh, 22 gauge shotgun shells. So I don't know. It just firearm laws don't make sense to me. Someone can kill you just as dead with a 30 out six as they could with I don't know, a sawed off shotgun. Dead is dead, right? And different weapons have different uses at different ranges and in different circumstances. And uh, just it's just unreasonable. All of a sudden, if you attach a bayonet to a rifle, all of a sudden it becomes more deadly and scary because of, I, I guess, all the drive by bayonettings that go on. I don't agree with federal firearms laws. I think they're retarded. I think the Second Amendment should make them go away. I don't agree with Ruby Ridge. I don't think Ruby Ridge was handled correctly, even if they did want to enforce those federal firearms laws. Waco definitely wasn't handled correctly. But looking at Mr. Haruchi and Mr. Haruchi's actions in light of his role in enforcing federal law, I don't think that Mr. Haruchi was a bad actor. So your mileage may vary. You can uh, hate all cops all the time for any reason. And that's your right as an American. Common Joe's retarded and have a great day.